spoilers to a lot of dope shit. There is no super robot anime more popular and critically acclaimed than Gurren Lagann. Lagann? Lagann? Lagann! 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 Remaining the most blazing, propellant, manliest anime respected almost universally, nothing has quite matched its brand of optimism and energy in over a decade since it came out, without just aping from it outright. But for as good as Gurren Lagann is, it did not achieve that greatness all on its own. Rather, it is a culmination, and arguably perfection, of iconography, themes, and storytelling established by several seminal anime classics and anime staff. And I know some of you were thinking, no shit, we know already. And I get that, but do you really know why? The challenge I have in making this video is that this is a subject that's been seemingly talked about to death by fans, but I honestly don't think anybody's really cut into the reasons any of this is referenced to begin with. They just point it out and state it flatly. It's a love letter to Super Robot anime, as if the conclusion is self-evident. But it's so much more than that. There's this through line that links everything together in a way I don't think anyone's stated before. This isn't your typical reference video that's gonna list what every attack comes from or zeroes in on this background character that looks like Squidward. This is a dissection of the five major influences that are the foundation of Gurren Lagann. And I can't think of a better one to start with than its most explicit and important inspiration. This is Get a Robo. <laughs> It's not just any super robot anime that Gurren Lagann is paying tribute to. It is specifically Getter Robo. The writer, Kazuki Nakashima, was chief editor for the Getter Robo saga, written by Ken Ishikawa, and it's confirmed by director Hiroyuki Imaishi to be Nakashima's primary inspiration for Gurren Lagann. But it's not just the similarly red, green, and yellow mecha these series have in common. Getter Robo has a brand of raw, over-the-top energy that is unmatched even by Gurren Lagann purely for taking an even more vicious and ghoulish tone as its story and characters spiral into insanity. If Gurren Lagann is who the hell do you think I am, Get a Robo is who the flying f do you f think I f Am. That confident, almost maniacal grin is infectious as these characters scream formations and attack names, tearing the flesh and bolts of their enemies apart. Getter Robo is an absolute beast, rocking heavy metal iconography like bat capes and axes. Death and destruction are the least of their concern when the fate of the world is at stake. When facing such a cruel and ruthless threat like the Dinosaur Kingdom and Emperor Gore, you need an equally merciless and brazen defender of justice. Getter is head and shoulders above other super robot anime in this regard, so it makes sense for Gurren Lagann to learn from the best, as well as take many of its key elements. Getter is a series with lots of firsts, most notably being the first giant robot. First don't care, don't care, don't care, still don't care. I don't care formed by combining separate machines together with multiple pilots. 
a mainstay of the genre and core to Gurren Lagann's most important ability. Combining might be one of the first things anyone knows about mecha anime thanks to more well-known titles in the West like Voltron. Not only is it just super cool and has great toy potential, but it thematically emphasizes the importance of teamwork and how taking different components is vital to success. The whole being better than the sum of its parts, if you will. Getter can't be successfully piloted by one person, at least not for long. Kamina can't succeed without Simone, and Simone can't succeed without his friends. Granted, Gurren Lagann doesn't have three different interchangeable forms, but the idea of using combining as assimilation, so Lagann can take control of an entire battleship or strap wings to itself, is pretty freaking cool. However, while it is its most important and unique attribute, practically speaking, it's not the most iconic ability. <laughs> As a matter of fact, drills are also predated by I don't Getter, care. though it doesn't have any of the thematic relevancy that Gurren places on it, as is the so-called Gynax pose made famous by Gunbuster, which itself is inspired by a lot of things, including Getter, for not simply the arm crossing, but also the climactic ripping out of its generator. As you may have seen, Getter is also widely known for having increasingly larger and more powerful forms of itself like Gurren Lagann, including one that, yes, also dwarfed entire galaxies. But none of that comes close to the most significant influence Getter Robo had to Gurren Lagann, which is the existence of spiral energy, or as Getter Robo calls them, Getter Rays. Both spiral energy and Getter Rays are limitless energy sources, tied directly to human willpower, blessed only to certain races including humanity, responsible for human evolution, and ultimately will lead to the destruction of the universe. In Gurren Lagann's case, it will cause a black hole-like cataclysm called the Spiral Nemesis, while in Getter Robo, the Getter Rays manifest into the godlike Getter Emperor and... Well, we don't know exactly. Ishikawa has said the Getter Emperor is the enemy of the entire universe, and we see its immense destructive power in a vision of the far future. But we also know it's still being controlled by humans like Ryoma, and it's never shown to be posing a direct threat to humanity. However, there's two key differences from Spiral Energy that I want to emphasize here. The first and most glaring would be the existence of the Anti-Spiral, which in Gurren Lagann is an alien race also blessed with Spiral Energy, but are instead driven to seal Spiral beings away and prevent the Spiral Nemesis and the end of the universe. It's an equal yet opposite force that exterminates and suppresses our heroes. There is no such equivalence in Getter Robo. Getter Rays are just Getter Rays, and humans are the chosen race that inherit them. So instead of an equal opposite force, you get all kinds of adversaries that aren't blessed by Getter Rays. There are humanoid dinosaurs and demon armies that rise from beneath the earth, and insectoid aliens from the future that all try and fail to conquer humanity for the sake of their own survival. Sound familiar? The, city sky opens up. the Beastmen in Gurren Lagann are also humanoid creatures not blessed with spiral energy, and in a sort of role reversal try and fail to subject humanity who also emerge from beneath the earth. And similar to Gurren Lagann, humanity isn't necessarily told they're the overdogs in Getter Robo. It isn't until they're shown the truth in a vision do the pieces click together and the reality sets in. So the conflicts themselves are fairly similar, but again that crucial difference is Gurren Lagann's final boss, facing a force equal to their own. The second key difference between the two is the ending, or lack thereof. Gurren Lagann's ending is a little muddled with some differences between the TV series and its film compilations, but ultimately have the same message, and the series ends conclusively with humanity's triumph and promise to protect the universe. That's it. No sequels, no prequels, no in betweenquels hardly any spin-offs. It's not a franchise. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for Getter. Yes, each TV series and OVA and manga series technically end, but none of them seem like true conclusions. Get a Robo has no conclusive ending. It barely has a continuity. The franchise is as unhinged and messy as the characters themselves. 
The manga was released out of chronological order, the TV series and OVAs are all broken into their own separate continuities, and various spin-offs written by authors other than Ishikawa even break the fourth wall and make this parallel universe chaos part of its story. In my opinion, the best entry you could watch for Get a Robo, Armageddon, basically starts in media res because it's a sequel to a radio drama that never got animated. Good fucking luck trying to make one of those franchise timeline videos you always make, because you're gonna get like five parallel universes. The original continuity by Ken Ishikawa ends with Get a Robo Arc, where the conflict only escalated further and further, reaches a new stage and antagonist, and ends on a cliffhanger. This was the last chapter before Ken Ishikawa's passing in November of 2006 five months before Gurren Lagann would premiere. It will never get an ending. It's crazy to think Nakashima wrote something like Gurren Lagann, which is so much about legacy and dealing with the death of your hero, around the same time his own hero would suddenly pass away. Granted, the show was well into production before Ishikawa's passing, the Touchstone Episode 8 had been storyboarded back in September, so, it's only an unfortunate coincidence that Gurren Lagann has parallels with the death of someone you looked up to and aspired to become. Writing such a story like Gurren Lagann, which owes so much to Get a Robo, to stick that landing and craft such a comprehensive, satisfying conclusion is, I think, the ultimate gift and tribute. But I want to dig even further. Why get a Robo and not say Mazinger Z? Imaishi does also give Mazinger some credit in an interview as being the first super robot to have a pilot who pilots from a detachable head like Simone, and it also has a similarly aggressive energy. But what about Getter makes it stand out from all these other super robot shows? Beyond the concrete details Gurren Lagann takes from, like the combining and the drills and the poses and the energy source, Reading Getter Robo and watching Gurren Lagann, you can tell there's a similar attitude shared by all the characters in Getter with Gurren Lagann's most pivotal character, Kamina. He is easily the most iconic and series-defining character, coining all the signature lines, installing most of the themes of the show, and being the propulsive motivating factor for the rest of the characters to actually pierce the heavens. I can't point to a Kamina parallel in Get a Robo. They basically all share that frame of mind he had, except a lot more... angry? <laughs> and a lot less optimistic. The main three pilots are different characters with their own unique journeys, and Kamina actually shares similarities with each of them. He's got daddy issues like Ryoma, leads a band of counter-terrorists like Hayato, and whose glorious death in battle propels much of the story later on, like Musashi slash Benkei. But what's mutual with all of them is one key trait, masculinity. <laughs> They don't spell it out like Gurren Lagann does, but the sentiment is still there under the surface. In Get a Robo, only real men, physically strong enough and brazen enough, can become pilots. And before you say it, yes, there are female Getter pilots. There are strong, capable women in both series. But that doesn't invalidate the other characters' hyper-masculine actions and personalities. Kamina champions bravery and an indomitable spirit, a paragon of masculinity, the hot-blooded grit, the loud and proud ego, the tough, rough, buff exterior, and literally volcanic interior. No fear, no shame, no fucks given. A man's man. Gurren Lagann appears to frame this masculinity very positively on the surface, but Kamina's weaknesses and pointed mortality 
make it clear it's not all it's cracked up to be on its own. It's reckless, ruthless, and impenetrable to common sense, almost apathetic to the feelings of others in favor of one's ego. Getter Robo's characters fall squarely into this trap, saying what's on their mind, laser focused on humanity's survival, even if that means giving up their own humanity. And of course, fighting for selfish reasons like revenge. Somewhat like Simone fighting to save Nia in spite of what he's doing potentially endangering the universe. There's also a very explicit pattern of self-sacrifice, which several characters do in Gurren Lagann, and especially in Getter Robo. Kitan and Lord Genome get these very specific spiral eyes which are ripped directly from Getter Robo whenever those characters are drunk on the glory of forfeiting their lives in a blaze of glory. Not a cut and dry illustration. Uh, there are several characters in Getter Robo that have these spiral eyes and that's just their normal design. Um, several characters get these spiral eyes themselves and they're not necessarily sacrificing themselves. And Simon himself actually gets these spiral eyes in the climax, and I don't think you could argue he's making the same kind of sacrifice that Kitan and Lord Genome are. Uh, but the, the point I was trying to make, and can't seem to word ergonomically, is the self-sacrifice angle, which is the parallel between the two. Oftentimes they're not just eager to die, they insist, oblivious to how their deaths may inflict their friends. <laughs> Sure, maybe it's all for the cause, but it's that logical extreme that is the ultimate toxin to their well-being. That's why they call it toxic masculinity, and more often than not, it's all style and no substance. Getter's pilots are only really successful because the Getter rays feed perfectly onto that energy, and it's the strongest source of energy in the series. But it's not like Kamino was able to harness that as effortlessly as Simone and the others can later on. Through Kamino, we can see what toxic masculinity is if you don't give it superpowers. It's talking a big game to make up for zooming down Shit's Creek. It's a brave smile covering up the lack of any plan whatsoever. Kamina is not this unbeatable hero, he's just lucky to have someone capable enough to carry out his vision. He says Simone is the method to his madness, the one who made his talk more than words. It's Simone's drill that will pierce the heavens, and Kamina is just instilling that attitude into someone he believes can accomplish anything. Kamina and Simone's relationship is what masculinity can accomplish when given the proper vehicle the impossible. In the case of Getter Robo, I believe Ishikawa knew where his story was heading, but just didn't manage to get there. Starting in Getter Robo Go, Ishikawa used this trope of characters having this grand epiphany where they suddenly understood everything about Getter Rays and humanity's destiny. But there ends up being so much reliance on the allure of that mystery, it falls flat by the time you reach the abrupt end. He kept teasing at something grander, but that's all it amounted to. Just a tease. There wasn't a vehicle or direction for it, he was just keeping it going, like many manga authors do, until they're told to wrap it up. There's a sense of ever-increasing dread that, no matter how many times Ryoma, Hayato, and Musashi slash Benkei, or their protégés, succeed, there's always going to be another imminent threat to humanity, and victory becomes less and less cathartic. I honestly really like that. There's a dark futility to it, and it seems like it can only end tragically and bitterly, which I guess is fitting, because there's no ending more bitter and tragic like no ending at all. His story in Ark seems way more ambitious than the other Super Robot series too. It, it didn't seem like simple junk food for kids. Most of these other series didn't fall for the trap Getter fell into, keeping itself going with repetitive threats. But even other shows that did, like Mazinger, somehow don't feel as tragically left unfinished, like Get a Robo. Ishikawa was starting to humanize the dinosaur kingdom, make his existing characters more complex while constantly adding new ones. But to what end, we'll sadly never know. Like Kamina, Ishikawa died before achieving that greatness. But also like Kamina, his efforts didn't go unadmired. The last entry in the Getter Robo saga isn't written by Ishikawa, 
but several other notable manga artists and authors who created an anthology of alternate scenarios and universes that further embellish and embolden the franchise of Getter Robo. Several other authors have taken up the mantle of trying to continue the story or give their alternate take. And in a genre that has since run its course and became oversaturated, Get a Robo is still remembered as one of the greats. A classic. Ishikawa had a lasting impact on manga and anime. His work may never be finished, but it will never be forgotten. Nakashima saw the value of a story like Get a Robo and with the help of a talented director and talented animators, performers, engineers, and producers, fulfilled Ishikawa's greatness with Gurren Lagann. Watching the scene of a passed-on Kamino encouraging a grown-up Simone seems a lot like the author of Get a Robo, Ken Ishikawa, encouraging the author of Gurren Lagann, Kausuki Nakashima, who took that raw and indelible spirit and carried through with a work that has touched the lives of so many fans around the world, farther than Getter ever could. Getter Robo is still a really cool series, warts and all, and I highly recommend the original manga, so you can get the origin and foundation of the series, and from there, you can watch most any of the anime, provided you go in not expecting to know quite what's going on at first. Like I said before, Getter is a messy and untamed franchise, much like the Getter pilots. It didn't have the proper vehicle to take the story to mainstream popularity and critical darling success. It takes a very skilled and inspired director and team to craft and pilot that vehicle, much like Simone and Team Daigaren. And considering this was the first TV series Imaishi ever directed, that makes it even more impressive. But like Nakashima, Imaishi had his own experience with Mecha that had a lasting impact on Gurren Lagann. And it wasn't just one series. It's several unique series, all made by one meme. I, I mean man. When discussing anything within the mecha genre, there must be no escape from discussion of Yoshiyuki Tomino. While the man didn't invent the conceit of giant robots, I would argue he's responsible for why we consider it a genre at all. That's not to put down other important creators in mecha anime. Ryosuke Takahashi, who came up the same time as Tomino, has several originals of his own, like Botoms and Lazner. And yes, the Yusha Brave series is extremely important too. Though, there doesn't seem to be one singular mastermind behind that project besides maybe Yoshitomo Yonitani? They immediately come to mind as a close second and third, and I can name several others, but they still don't have the longevity and notoriety of Tomino. His work is the definition of prolific, being the creator of eight completely unique mecha series that aren't Mobile Suit Gundam, as well as Mobile Suit fucking Gundam, the 14th highest grossing media franchise on Earth, of which he's helmed eight of its 20-something installments. And what's maddening is, he's still at it after almost 60 years in the industry, 48 of those as a director, currently working on a five-film pentology adaptation of his last TV series, Reconquista in G. To understand Gurren Lagann's influences, you need to watch a Tomino anime. And I'm not necessarily suggesting Gundam either. His work shares a lot of similarities with each other, and subsequently shared with Gurren Lagann. The first and most glaring inspiration is the large and eccentric ensemble cast. Gurren Lagann and most Tomino anime populate themselves with a wide crew of unique, memorable characters of all ages, sizes, genders, and levels of intelligence. It's a hodgepodge of wackos with memorable names, literal children are often on board, and everyone's barely holding it together. They're usually found aboard one ship and gathered together by nothing more than coincidence, and must work together to fight against the formidable, organized, and often militarized bad guys. It's a great dynamic that pits impossible odds against ordinary people, 
And it's not simply the cast, but there's similar tropes in the individual characters too. The four generals in Gurren Lagann function like the various parades of officers in Tomino's anime, such as Gundam's Zabi family, with each unique general falling one by one to the titular mecha, which like Lagann, most Tomino protagonists either steal and or unearth. But no matter what, they always inexplicably know how to pilot it from the word go. Simone and Kamina each represent the two brands of protagonists you'll typically find in a Tomino anime. They're either guns blazing, overconfident, manly men like Kamina, or the awkward, in over his head young boy like Simone, who also from time to time gets that fierce, angry burst of motivating energy that gives them the edge. Either one can be compelling because you never know what to expect, and it's a really fun dynamic to see these two archetypes bounce off each other in the same show. It's like the best of both worlds. And then you have Viral as the classic Tomino trope of the one soldier or commander who gets pitted against our heroes from the very beginning, becomes a vengeful rival, and always manages to scrape by loss after loss only to wind up as an ally by the end of it, most notably like Gundam and Ideon. The heroines are also common Tomino tropes, Yoko as the strong, capable, and brash action hero with a romantic side, and Nia as the sweet motherly type who's also royalty tied directly to the bad guys in some way. She's even brainwashed later into working for the enemy, much like Elchi in Sabungal, which Imaishi has said was a major inspiration for Gurren Lagann, which we'll touch more on later. But everyone, from the heroes to the villains, are always very loud-spoken and brimming with attitude. Those speeches in Gurren Lagann are literally how Tomino characters talk in a casual setting. This is a tangent, but also my video, and I can do what I want. Tomino anime always have this boisterous, declarative way of speaking. Either talking out loud exactly what's happening, or what they're feeling. Sarah is actually pretty sexy. Her clothes make her look skinny. How dare you! Or making these angsty, verbose accusations or platitudes to one another. <laughs> This is no Zaku, boy! No Zaku! It can often come across as awkward or robotic, like, this just isn't how humans talk to each other. <laughs> It's comedically most apparent to me in arguably Tomino's most infamous work, Garzi's Wing. Oh my god, I felt like I was having a dream! There is a war going on! Even dinosaurs are here! I must somehow make sense of our convoluted situations. I'm not kidding you, minus the awful vocal performance, that's more or less how his characters talk. It's so blunt and straightforward, it can wrap back around as genuinely engaging. It's especially funny in a show like Zabungo, which is more of a comedy that's actually self-aware. And breaks the fourth wall.
but even in Tomino's dramas, it's very melodramatic and passionate dialogue. Once you accept that's just how they talk, they really come alive and act like characters. Again, they're all unique. Never feel like clones of each other or copycats of his previous work. Mostly. And all of them equally capable of being unpredictable, abrasive, lovesick, or completely fucking stupid. And it's fantastic! Gurren Lagann's characters would fit perfectly in a show like Zaboongle or Zambot 3. There's a great mix of serious, goofy, and unstable. There are side characters you can get attached to despite knowing almost nothing about them. And they're so unique and memorable that they can stick with you for years after you finish watching. I will say, they're a lot less angsty than how Tomino might write them. You don't exactly have characters constantly slapping each other. Logon is well loved for how positive and uplifting it is, but I personally can't help but get more enjoyment out of Tomino's more erratic, pressure cooker cast that obviously can't stand one another, but somehow come together and succeed in spite of it. But still, it was bizarre how often during my rewatch I thought Gurren Lagann felt like a Tomino anime. Gurren Lagann fans who say they aren't mecha fans have no idea what they're talking about. It's no different from the rest of the genre that Tomino pioneered. I said before Tomino was not the creator of giant robots, but he is widely credited as the creator of real robots. For the unaware, there's a difference between super robot anime and real robot anime. The easiest distinction is whether the robot has unlimited, almost cartoonish superpowers, or more like an actual robot that can break or run out of power. Yes, it's all fiction, and robots that are 20 meters tall are never going to be actually practical, let alone possible. And unlike my Berserk video, I'm going to make a point in saying this distinction is a gradient and not binary, but making the effort to ground these robots in some shape of reality can lend to better immersion and storytelling. There's more tension for one thing. Characters can run out of ammo any second, and you know if the windshield breaks, they're gonna be exposed to the elements. Zabungle has its share of physical slapstick comedy, but it still maintains a sense of danger for the characters due to its choice of real robots over magical super robots. But it's not just the robots that are affected by this. The characters have to resort to real strategy too. There's a lot more techno jargon and decision making because it isn't as simple as calling out an attack and willing it to happen. All as a means of grounding the anime in reality. This represents practically half of all anime in the mecha genre. And as I said earlier, it's Tomino that's entirely credited for it. In the twilight of an era in the 1970s, where super robot anime was becoming oversaturated, Studio Sunrise wanted to mature from subcontracting work into a respected studio that made original anime that could be considered featured film material, like Space Battleship Yamado. After two attempts at making super robot anime, they had one last chance before needing to dial back. At one of their meetings, nobody seemed to have any ideas, except Tomino, who pulls out 30 pages of ideas that would become the pitch from Mobile Suit Gundam. As overtread as I think it is to talk about how important Gundam was to mecha anime, it actually strongly relates to the dynamic of Kamina and Simone in Gurren Lagann. I'll let Gundam's animation director and character designer Yoshikazu Yasuhiko explain. <laughs> で、正義感に溢れてて頭もいいかもしくは悪いか悪くて運動能力がこうある程度ひたすら元気とかねみんなに愛されるっていうそういうあのまあヒーロー中心的な主人公当たり前ですけどねそれに飽きてるんですよだ
but ultimately endure and outshine its predecessors, becoming a lifelong icon and piercing the heavens. It's why mecha anime is still being made, albeit maybe not as much these days. Imaishi has said, while Makashima brought his experience of Get a Robo to the project, Imaishi brought his experience on Gundam and Real Robots, which provided the framework and vehicle of a real robot anime for an otherwise over-the-top masculine super robot anime. Gurren Lagann has many calling cards of classical super robot anime, not just from Get a Robo, of course. From the title cards showing each robot's names, to the extended transformation sequences, to all the little nods and homages to attacks and poses from a library of its ancestors. And of course, it has a Monster of the Week structure too. But it's good Monster of the Week! paced much like Tomino and real robot anime. There's still a foe to face every week, but they're often recurring or have miniature arcs to them, changing up their abilities while steadily increasing the difficulty, forcing the heroes into scenarios where they have to problem solve, to the delight of the audience. It's not episodic like most super robot anime, there's a clear ongoing storyline, which might not seem very special considering what we've come to expect from anime, but we have Gundam and real robot anime to thank for that mentality. The very reason Gurren Lagann is set in a desert, according to Imaishi, is as a tribute to Tomino's series Zabungo. Not only does it make for a great parallel to the classic western genre, with showdowns and long journeys with no rules, it also allows the robot action to happen believably without damage to property or innocent bystanders. You can tell this is a concern for the characters of Gurren Lagann during the show's second half, where there's consequences from Simon recklessly blowing up an anti-spiral ship. And that's in stark contrast to super robot shows like Getter Robo and Mazinger, where there's hardly any repercussions for the destruction they cause. I think consequences are a significant trait to mecha anime. But Tomino actually brought that to the table even before Gundam. To reiterate, before Gundam, super robots were the mecha genre. There was no such thing as ammo. The robots recovered completely after every fight. And even when entire cities were leveled to nothing, it didn't matter so long as the good guys won anyway. Tomino wanted to push against this idea with Zambot 3, because as he would prove later with Gundam, he saw potential in robot anime to be more dramatic. In Zambot 3, there's just as much focus on the cool super robot action as there is focus on the ramifications of such violence. These alien robots are wrecking havoc, and Zambot 3 comes and saves the day. But nobody thanks them, because the heroes are partly responsible for all the damage, and in some ways are directly responsible for the aliens attacking them in the first place. A little piece gets cut off from one of the enemies, and it would crash onto a cruise ship with hundreds of refugees trying to flee from their coastal city's annihilation. And you can see scores of people losing their lives in an instant. It's brutal. And this threat can't be stopped without significant self-sacrifice on behalf of the crew. Nearly the whole cast gets killed off. It's where the infamous nickname Kill Em All Tomino started from. But as I mentioned in my Ideon video, people love bringing this nickname up without asking why? When talking about one of his other, more controversial works, Victory Gundam, Tomino had this great interview with Hideaki Anno where he mentions this. Recently there have been rice shortages from time to time. It's a very good thing in my opinion, it allows them to imagine a little bit more seriously a case where there really isn't any more food. The advantage for people creating entertainment in that case is to be able to say, sorry if this is disturbing, but we're showing these austere parts in the anime you like as well, in case it helps in 10 or 20 years from now. The man himself is a very eccentric character, like the ones he populates his series with. He's often very outspoken and doesn't pull his punches talking about the industry or other creators. As an example, he happens to name all the different robots or vehicles or even characters weird names like Gelgoog, Iron Gear, and Kitty Kitten, just because he knows the higher-ups don't actually care about the show 
and will approve whatever names he sends them. But even with his trademark cynicism and idiosyncrasies, mood swinging from lighthearted goofiness to grim, merciless brutality, even if he says he hates anime, you can tell, watching his shows, that Tomino cares about anime a lot, and what it's capable of. Zambot 3's ending elevated what could have easily been just a Saturday morning cartoon, and made it a legend, to the point where Imaishi himself said in an interview with Otaku USA, he wished he could have an ending for Gurren Lagann as epic as the finale of Zambot 3. Obviously, temper your expectations a little. They aren't throwing galaxies like shurikens or facing down an attack the size of the Big Bang in that one. But characters getting picked off one by one in rapid succession, like in Gurren Lagann, is especially Tomino inspired. <laughs> While Tomino gets a lot of credit for what he's done, he doesn't get nearly the same amount of respect. He's treated as a meme by our community. I guess they're put off by how ridiculous or messy or crazy his characters can be. How he can be somehow both too silly and too grimdark. He says all the most outrageous things in his interviews. He's too weird to be taken all that seriously. Anime's a serious medium, guys. He must be a hack that just got lucky that one of his series took off. Don't give that guy any creative freedom. He's nuts if you let him loose. He needs to be reined in. Idiots! <laughs> Colossal dumbass! Colossal moron! How dare anyone say that about Tomino? How dare anyone say anything like that? about one of the most hardest working, important figures in the anime industry. その後ろ姿を見てましたから。なんとか、なんとかその I don't care how bad you think Garzi's wing is, do not judge a man's body of work by a three-episode OVA! Watch Ideon, watch Zaboongle, watch the show Garzi's wing is based on that's basically the first anime isekai. I totally get fans who don't vibe with him right away. I personally wasn't much of a fan of his work for a long time after watching three of his Gundam series. But once I became aware of his character writing, his creativity, and both his sense of humor and melodrama, I really started to enjoy his anime and became a Tomino fan. The show that really made it all click for me was Overman King Gainer, but maybe it'll be different for you. Yoshiyuki Tomino has had a lasting impact on anime. He is why giant robot anime are where they are today, including Gurren Lagann. There's a misconception that Tomino has a propensity for bleak and dour endings. Yes, there's more than one of his series where almost everyone dies, but that shouldn't automatically mean they're negative endings. In every single one that I've seen, the battles conclude, and the characters are left at peace. The bitterness makes it all the more cathartic and satisfying. I think Gurren Lagann takes after that too. It's an ending that feels bittersweet. Not just because some of the characters didn't make it out on the other side, but also because it's ending. This great show with characters we've come to love is over. That's often what Tomino endings feel like. Not because so many characters died or bad things happened, but it's the end of a really good thing. Speaking the uh, speaking of the end of a really good thing.
It might seem strange to say the animation studio that made Gurren Lagann also inspired it, but not when you're talking about Studio Gainax. No other anime company has this much widely discussed history, character, and infamy behind it. It can't be ignored that Gurren Lagann is a Gainax anime, and the show has become indispensable to the studio's legacy. At a glance, a newcomer might think this only runs so deep as a few winks to previous characters and iconography, but fans of their work insist there's an energy or Gainax soul to much of what the studio made and what its descendants continue to make. To understand that Gainax soul is to understand Gurren Lagann, and the best way to demonstrate that would be to go back before they called themselves Gainax. Back when a group of nerds called themselves Daikon Film. Daikon 3, the opening animation for the Nihon science fiction Taikai convention in 1981, was the result of computer science dropout Toshio Okada and nuclear engineering dropout Yasuhiro Takeda making anime when they had never made an anime before. Out of the two of them and fellow university students Hiroyuki Yamaga, Takami Akai, and Hideaki Anno, only those last two apparently knew how to draw. It took them nearly a year to make a five and a half minute animated short. But by some miracle, not only did they narrowly make their deadline, but the short was also pretty good. Apparently it might have saved the convention from bankruptcy with its VHS sales. It was their foot in the door into the anime industry. And when they came back for an encore two years later, well, there's a reason they don't bring up Daikon 3 as much. Daikon 4 is just a taste of Gainax's two greatest qualities. Making dope iconic shit, while being real nerds about it. What stands out to me about Daikon 4, besides how fucking awesome it is, would be how much science fiction, comics, fantasy, and anime it's referencing. It's a long-running tradition of a lot of Gainax anime, including Gurren Lagann, even though the Playboy Bunny is supposed to be copyrighted. This is the studio that would later make an anime homaging their own founders in Otaku no Video, which references countless other anime and manga from the 70s and 80s. Gunbuster and Nadia also wear their inspirations on their sleeves, which makes them a lot of fun to watch if you're savvy to older anime. Homage is baked into Studio Gainax's identity, so naturally Gurren Lagann cuts from the same cloth, tributing other anime like Captain Harlock, Akira, and... yes... Spongebob. Gurren Lagann is a Gainax anime, a studio by nerds for nerds. But it ran deeper than outright references. This trait of being by nerds for nerds was attractive to many obsessively nerdy anime fans, or otaku, who in the 1980s and 90s were indulging in a golden era of nerddom. Mass production of OVAs, manga magazines like Shonen Jump hitting their stride, and a whole new strange medium called video game. Anime and manga as the weird, eccentric, pervy hot mess for nerds we know it today was defined in that window of time that Gainax was founded. Anime became more self-referential. Tropes were cauterized and trends were squeezed of all their worth. Studios made anime that catered to what they liked, which appealed stronger with the already niche audience of otaku. And I think that carries into Gurren Lagann's embrace of many anime-centric tropes, such as the obligatory beach episode, the bathhouse episode, the compilation episode, Time skips, the penultimate dreamscape episode, eye catches, recap narrations, playing the OP during a climactic battle, and jiggle physics, because Gainax apparently invented that too. It's unclear to me how much Gainax truly influenced this homogeny in the 80s to early 90s, 
considering how small their output actually was at that time. Though their influence would become undeniable in the late 90s to today, but we'll, we'll get to that. But since they were referencing so much anime in the work they did make already, they certainly contributed to it. More significantly, however, the studio is still fondly remembered as one of the first created by anime nerds, not former staff or major conglomerates. The studio is a mascot for the next generation of the anime industry that grew up watching anime and tokusatsu on TV, going to conventions with cosplay and VHS trading and figure building and submitting to best girl contests in anime magazines. I'm sure that older generation of Miyazaki and Tomino and Tazaki were also anime fans, but more like an, oh, I like doing what I'm doing sort of fan. And, uh... <laughs> Not that sort of fan. <laughs> The first generation had firmed up Japanese animation as an industry. Now it was these guys' turn to make it. Unfortunately, as you might expect, making it is a whole other story from liking it. The name Gainax comes from Totori Prefecture's slang word for giant, and the X was added at the end apparently because it sounded cool. Which, yeah. They're not wrong, but that already tells you exactly what this studio is about, being giant and sounding cool. And their work reflects that. Again, the Daikon openings are wildly ambitious in scope for what were basically glorified commercials and are still talked about to this day. Gainax's first official work, Royal Space Force, is even further ambitious and expensive. It ended up flopping from poor marketing and being too niche, but it's still seriously impressive and would only be outdone by Akira a year later. And then Gunbuster, holy freaking crap. What an iconic series, and a bit of a technical marvel in its own right. The last episode in black and white apparently cost the studio more money to make, but nothing is bigger or grander than Gurren on itself. Its sense of scale is second to none, so it's very emblematic of such an ambitious studio. But those first few 80s anime and a handful of small OVAs were pretty much all they had going for them. Not exactly a prolific catalog. They weren't giants in the way we might think of them now. Even so, they would still manage to inspire many young anime fans who would eventually join the company themselves. Only to find it totally gasping for air and begging for death. They weren't even five years old yet before falling on seriously hard times. The studio had barely managed to complete their first and thus far only TV anime, Nadia in the Secret of Blue Water. Unfortunately, while their talent and passion for making anime was strong, their business sensibilities were not. Toshio Okada turned out to be a terrible president, boasting about how cool their next project will be without any results. Hiroyuki Yamaga, bless his soul, is still obsessed with a sequel to Royal Space Force, that he's failed to produce anything for in like 30 years. And as much of a genius Hideaki Anno is, who deserves all the time and creative freedom in the world, when it's time to direct TV anime with a tight schedule, he always finds himself working by the seat of his pants. The way Callum May or the Canapa Effect puts it on Anime News Network, in some ways, financial responsibility, sensible work hours, and organized schedules are antithetical to the core of Studio Gainax as a studio. For a studio named after being giant and sounding cool, they were really anything but. After Nadia finished in April of 1991, they didn't helm another TV anime until October of 1995. Over four years, they were an anime studio that basically didn't make anime for more than four years. Most of the original founders left. Whoever was left literally couldn't be paid, so most of the company's staff also left. And then here comes bright young animators like Hiroyuki Imaishi and Fully Cooley director Kazuya Suramaki, who walk in on this husk of a studio that couldn't even produce most of their next anime in-house. 
instead needing to give most of it to Tatsunoko Productions. And yet, only in their darkest hour, Gainax wouldn't just strike oil, but fucking diamonds. It's without question that Neon Genesis Evangelion is Gainax's greatest success. And no matter how dysfunctional the studio had been before, or would continue to be, they truly became the giants they always boasted of being. If their impact on anime was in any way questionable before they made Evangelion, it would be undeniable afterward. And it gets compared to Gurren Lagann a lot for how vastly different they appear to be. Gurren Lagann is seen as cool, optimistic, and fun, while Evangelion is often seen as more cerebral, depressing, and... Uh... It, not, not fun. But I don't think that automatically means Gurren Lagann is saying, Quit being so sad, Shinji! Get in the robot! Purely by virtue of being made by the same studio. Imaishi does point out this refusal attitude was made very common after Evangelion, but also points out how this back and forth is cyclical, meaning it's happened before. Shinji was not the first mecha pilot that didn't want to get in the robot, though he certainly memified it. This is just the pendulum swinging the other way, like it did in the late 70s with Super Robot anime and Gundam. Evangelion is also a Gainax anime with its own share of influences, and like Gurren Lagann, it's applying old ideas with a skillful vehicle to make an enduring classic that also happened to gross a billion fucking dollars? But to suggest Gurren Lagann is a repudiation or response or sister series to Evangelion is to conveniently ignore every other anime Gainax made in that whole decade between the two. <laughs> Lagon wasn't Gainax's first attempt at this distancing. It's just one of several anime from this next generation of staff that were trying to escape Evangelion's shadow. Since Ava was such a smash hit, the series had practically become the studio's whole identity. Gainax wasn't just an anime studio. They were the studio that made Evangelion. They were getting newfound respect from fans and sponsors alike. But with all the fresh blood pumped into the studio, they wanted to make anime that was different. All of Gainax post Ava is far more wacky, fluid, expressive, and this obviously carried into Gurren Lagann. You can begin to see it in the studio's next TV anime, Karikano, and every anime after it, like Fooly Cooly, Maha Romatic, and Die Buster. Which the staff made particularly as a way of going back to how Gainax used to make anime. The fact that this conversation of Evangelion vs. Gurren Lagann exists to the exclusion of Die Buster, which came before, is reductionist. The studio isn't having some back and forth amongst themselves of what humanity's destiny is or something. They just wanted to keep making dope iconic shit and just be nerds about it like they always have. But like they always have, the studio would only run into more trouble. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fame of Evangelion was intoxicating. The company would go on to commit fraudulent tax evasion, waste money on offshoot companies like Tomato Farms, and be sued twice for mishandling the rights to the series. Ava was such a giant of a hit, the company frankly couldn't handle it. Things were no different as they were before their big break. They've always struggled with poor management and risky business decisions. They spiraled into oblivion, with all their anime staff splintering off and forming their own studios, until there was nothing left. The studio that embodied large-scale, hot-blooded ambition didn't have the control needed to avoid failure. Wherever have I heard that before? No! Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second, Gurren Lagann came out years before Gainax split apart. If I'm about to say Kamino was the studio Gainax to Simon's studio trigger, 
that has to be just a coincidence, right? Well, yeah. But it's not the only Gainax anime with that same coincidence. So, Giant X to you know what? GX! Gainax predicted it themselves once before. Otaku no Video doesn't just depict how General Products, aka Gainax, came to be, but also the studio's rise, fall, and rise again. It's very interesting watching Otaku no Video with Gurren Lagann in mind, because you can clearly see the parallels to the second episode with Gurren Lagann's second half. There's a time skip. Simon and Kenkubo have grown up to be leaders of powerful organizations. Suddenly, the floor gives out underneath. The love of their life betrays them, and they're thrown out or arrested by their own people. But they discover an ally or former enemy down in the hole alongside them, and together they make a rapid ascent, outwit their usurpers, and go on to achieve even greater heights. And yes, this phoenix moment is just like Studios Trigger and Kara, rising from the ashes of their forefathers and finding more long-lasting success. All while still doing it their way. No fear, no shame, not a single fuck given. Spiral beings, the Gainax soul, being a fucking otaku, it's all one and the same. If you wield them carelessly, they'll lead to your destruction. But wield them well, then they will pierce the heavens. <laughs> Okay, where was I? Right. Wherever have I heard that before? Gainax was like Kamina, who inspired this entire generation of people with their work, but weren't able to watch their back and inevitably bit the dust like he did. Masculinity isn't quite the word to describe it, but they do share similar traits naming yourself after being giant and sounding cool, making these wildly ambitious projects that don't find the traction you expected. And when you finally stumble upon the success, you don't know what to do with it. Don't get me wrong, I think most of us loved Gainax and Kamina for at least two of those reasons, but you can see without proper control, it can lead to some pretty toxic consequences. And yet, at the same time, Everyone can't help but admire them. Even if they have their name on this nothing of an OVA or short, it piques people's interest because their name's on it. No matter how much I insist that this pose is from Getter Robo, I must concede and understand that this is the Gynax pose. That symbol of confidence and defiance is theirs alone. Just like how Kamina leaves an impact on everyone who meets him, not just Simone, Gainax managed to leave an impact. A giant one. On anime. No matter how cynical you can get about them, there really is a Gainax soul. Some indescribable quality, like spiral energy, that flows in each of these anime. That same spirit that willed Daikon 3 into existence, and willed Daikon 4 into excellence. Even though Gurren Lagann's staff would eventually follow Imaishi away from the studio that gave them their start, they would learn from Gainax's mistakes, and carry with them that same spirit that made that studio so great. Making the dopest iconic shit, and being absolute chads about it. Yoshinori Kanada is an animator and storyboarder who worked from the 1970s through the 2000s, and is arguably the single most influential animator in Japan. That's a very larger-than-life claim, but I find it appropriate when you're discussing such a larger-than-life figure. When there's a whole generation named after you like the Kanada School, with the respect of titans like Hayao Miyazaki and Hideaki Anno, and are anointed the father of Sakuga by fans all around the world, 
I don't think it's such a hyperbole to make. When I say Sakuga, it refers to a sudden burst of intensive and expressive animation in the typically limited medium of anime. Basically, when the animation suddenly gets really, really good. And while it would be stupid to argue Kanada invented good animation, he's a core reason for why we have Sakuga in the first place. Kanada was, frankly, good at animating practically everything. Incredible background animation, character animation, vehicle animation, and especially effects animation, culminating with his single most iconic trademark in Genma Tyson, the Kanada Dragon. It's been homaged and repurposed in countless other anime, and was the scene that effectively made him the first celebrity animator, with magazine specials and his own fan club. Gurren Lagann didn't include any Kanada dragons, unfortunately, but don't worry, that's basically the only omission. Yoshinori Kanada is the perfect choice to base Gurren Lagann's entire visual aesthetic upon, not just because it properly matches the show's narrative, intensity, and attitude, but even the man himself, not simply his work, is an influence to Gurren Lagann. Uh, but now we're getting ahead of ourselves. To start with, what is the-
know you're working with a cool dude if he doesn't take his signature sunglasses off while he animates. Kanata was as expressive, stylish, and alive as the dope shit that he made. His peers remember him as a magnetic source of optimism and effort for everyone working around him, encouraging other animators and showing them new tricks. He wasn't just some hotshot prodigy, he apparently wasn't even all that good when he started. But with proper guidance and encouragement in his early years at Toei Animation, he managed to come into his own. So I think that in turn was Kanada returning the favor to the ones who came after him. Kanada was often very demanding, sometimes to others, but mostly demanding of himself, which was really a necessity if he wanted the cool stuff he animated to get done on time. He didn't exactly stick to the same conventions as everyone else. His animation was usually not something you could make a seamless looping gif out of. It wasn't very economic, but it sure looked damn cool. Having Kanada animate your OP was so clutch because you could have that shit play every episode. Instead of animating on twos or threes, so one drawing per two or three frames, he kind of just animated on whatever he felt like. It might go two, one, two, two, or one, two, three, two, two. And this technique is in Gurren Lagann, too. Some people might see his animation as free-spirited, and in a way they're right since Kanada never meticulously planned anything in advance. But that doesn't mean what you saw in the final result was also the first draft. It was probably the third or fourth since he still strived for the best result. As Hideaki Yano said, if it wasn't cool, Kanada wouldn't have drawn it. He was such a total chad, you could tell it was him that animated something because of his distinct style. which. Calling an animator out for doing a particular cut is something that's common practice today by animation fans, but was unusual during Kanada's time. Speaking strictly commercial anime, animators go largely uncredited for which moments were theirs. Even today, most of it is left up to speculation. We know now that Miyazaki animated this sequence in Flying Phantom Ship, and we can spot Yasuji Mori's work from a mile away, but it's not like fans cared what the very first animation director worked on back then. Most of them still don't. The reason Kanada is considered the father of Sakuga is because he was the one that normalized the practice of animators expressing their own artistry and style, when they'd normally be restricted and uncredited. Even working under a director like Miyazaki, who had such a firm grip on how his films look, you can still tell it's Kanada drawing it. He finds ways to express himself his way, while also supporting Miyazaki's vision. He worked on all of Miyazaki's films between Nausicaa and Princess Mononoke, so basically the majority of them. Even if you had never heard of Kanada before this, you definitely have seen his work before. Being able to know the people responsible for what you love, it's almost like having a personal connection with them through their art, which makes the experience of watching anime that much more special. And just imagine knowing the guy for real! To quote Hideaki Anno, again, Kanada represented hope for me. He was an end to strive for. Surely by now you already know where I'm going with this. Who else wears iconic sunglasses? This has definitely never been outright stated by the creators, but I'd argue Kanada is practically the real-life counterpart to Kamina. They share tons of traits both positive and negative with each other. And while there isn't any smoking gun tier evidence to connect them besides Kanada's stylistic influence on the staff, which we'll obviously get to... I think it's a strong point to bring up in order to reinforce this idea of masculinity with the right vehicle. Kamina and Kanada both grew up to be strong-willed people after both of them failed to take after their fathers. Kamina in following his dad to the surface, and Kanada in becoming a pilot like his dad. Both were ambitious, positive-minded, and leaders in the way they attract many other talented people to them. They were adventurous, Kanada loved traveling to different countries, and Kamina was constantly moving forward, never wanting to settle. Both pushed boundaries and tried things that were thought to be ridiculous or impossible. And the work they leave behind is applied, remembered, and celebrated, even when they unexpectedly pass away sooner than anyone would have wanted. 
That last point is purely coincidence. Kanada passed away two years after Gurren Lagann, but I think the resemblance remains. There's an inherent masculinity to Kanada's work and life. He did things his way at the expense of his own well-being. He never stopped working until the day he died. And as much of an influence he had on others, like Kamina, he wouldn't be the one that endured as a legend, like his contemporaries. What always sticks out to me about Kanada is, if this guy was such a creative and prolific person in the industry, to where you had all these other industry people like Miyazaki respecting him, how come he never went on to become a director? Kanada directed a few episodes, but that's about it. Which is a shame, because the ones he did lead are incredible! Kanada was not just a great animator, but also a great storyboarder. So he had the talent to make the transition. But something must have discouraged him from doing it. That something was birth. Birth is considered to be Kanada's magnum opus, at least as close to one as we're going to get. It's one of the first OVAs ever made, which would set off an explosion of influential experimental anime of the 80s and 90s. The animation is of course the standout, with long chase scenes and large-scale action set pieces. And while the story and setting aren't all that complicated, it's still wholly unique and imaginative. There aren't many parallels to Gurren Lagann that aren't just coincidences, like how both are science fiction set in a desert, and the conflict is organics versus inorganics, like spiral beings and anti-spiral, but it's more valuable bringing up birth for what it meant for Kanada's career. Despite having creative control for most of the project, even designing the heroine after his own wife, Kanada wasn't the director. Like Kamina, Kanada needed a vehicle to help channel his energy towards a goal. So he had his close friend and colleague, Sadamitsu Shinya, helm the project for him. Shinya would do everything the way Kanada wanted it, but would take most of the responsibility when they couldn't decide on what to do with the story next. It does feel like set pieces strung together by and then, and then, and then storytelling, and the ending in particular seems pretty rushed and confusing, which might have contributed to sales being half of what they'd anticipated. <laughs> Even Kanada himself gave it a failing grade of 50%, but even still you can tell from watching it there's a very creative and talented mastermind behind it. Not to rag on the director, Shinya, but if Kanada had someone to give structure and meaning to his ideas, it could have led to something truly influential. Pardon the cultural whiplash for a second, but that was the case with Rick and Morty. It was Dan Harmon that gave purpose and cohesion to Justin Roiland's creative stream of consciousness that led that show to critical mainstream success, at least at the time. I'm happy Birth was able to manifest at all. Making something like this is extremely difficult. But despite having more original ideas later in life, Birth would be the only one to make it out. He helped so many others pierce the heavens and achieve greatness. But Kanada wouldn't manage to pierce it himself. That's okay. Not many of us do. If it was that easy, it wouldn't exactly be piercing the heavens, would it? But lucky for us, where there's a Kamina, there's bound to be a sea mode. Out of everyone inspired by Yoshinori Kanada, nobody carries his mantle like Hiroyuki Imaishi. As a key animator, he not only embraced all of Kanada's style, but he pushed that envelope until he ripped it in half, making it entirely his own. 
It has all the expression, intensity, magnitude, and clarity, with even more extreme poses, splashier effects, and fewer frames in between. It leans even further illustrative and sketchy, to the point where it might not be as organic and fluid as Kanada, but still very much alive. It's like Kanada at an 11, and while I somehow can't find an interview where Imaishi mentions him, they did collaborate on a project. It's an opening cutscene for Musashi 2 Blade Master, in a literal passing of the torch moment, with Kanada as the storyboarder and Imaishi animating it. I think this is the peak of Kanada's style, at its most potent and the point where Imaishi inherits it. The difference, however, came in 2004, where he would make his directorial debut on a film adaptation of Dead Leaves, something Kanada was never able to accomplish himself. And Imaishi has never looked back since. On the subject of how he did it, Imaishi says he has to focus more on instructing everyone instead of drawing himself. He can get away with some drawing if it's a short work like Dead Leaves, but for a long TV series like Gurren Lagann, there's no way. In order for Gurren Lagann to be consistent in Imaishi and therefore Kanada's style, most of the animators would have to be at least familiar with it. And they were. Many of them take after Kanada like Imaishi, but are still free to express their individuality, which also honors Kanada's legacy. Imaishi coordinated a vision that makes it seem like it was all animated by him, when he's actually credited for very little of it compared to Yoyo Shinari, Sushio, and Osamu Kobayashi, who is the one you can thank for episode 4. He happens to be a good director in his own right, and was also the founder of Kanada's fan club. Kanada's passion was finally given a vehicle and resulted in not just a great show, but an entire studio's brand renowned the world over. Imaishi is the Simone to Kanada's Kamina, and managed to make not just Gurren Lagann, but several other classics as well. I can only imagine how full circle it would be if somehow Imaishi and Studio Trigger would someday bring those ideas Kanada had dreamed of and turned them into reality. But there's something about Imaishi's way of directing that seems awfully familiar to me. Rewatching Gurren Lagann, but most of all watching Dead Leaves, did it click for me another significant industry icon, one whose work I like to think I'm versed in enough to spot a mile away. Imaishi's got a lot of frequently used tricks. Lots of split screens, Dutch angles, and is that? A triple take? Oh my god, it's Osama Dezaki, the premier classic anime director! I'll give credit to Imaishi for making the transition himself, but he couldn't have picked a better inspiration to take from. He applies Dezaki's greatest strengths, making dope-looking shit that is as clearly conveyed to the audience as possible, using cost-saving techniques on a tight budget. By doing this, Imaishi can make a consistently cinematic, well-animated show that is accessible to all anime fans new and old. Gurren Lagann is peppered with postcard memories, stark lighting, and punchy diegetic sound, with very expressive faces, his own recurring motifs, and even the exact same black title cards with white text! <laughs> and Suzuku! The show is such a great watch for Osama Dezaki fans like myself. And it happens to have one other thing related to Dezaki that I also really love. It's kind of the only reason I wanted to make this video to begin with. And you're damn right it's gonna take 30 minutes. <laughs> Ashita no Joe is a boxing manga and anime from the 1970s, and yes, is my favorite anime if you couldn't already tell by its prevalence on my channel. And having made a feature-length video picking out every last reference from its spiritual successor, Megalobox, I feel like I'm the most qualified to talk about the Joe references in Gurren Lagann. As I mentioned before, Gurren Lagann is homaging lots of anime at once. So to cite Ashita no Joe as a significant influence based purely on a handful of references might seem like a stretch exploited by my bias for it. This is very true, and unlike all these other sections, I haven't found Imaishi mention or demonstrate a real-life connection to Joe. <laughs> Except yes, I did. Oops!
While Gur and Lagan wasn't quite Imaishi and Nakashima's first work together, their first bonding experience together was at a family restaurant at 2am sharing their mutual passion for Ashtono Joe. They've expressed they wanted to make Gur and Lagan just like the dramatic, passionate anime they watched when they were kids. Specifically, Osamu Tezaki's anime like Takarajima, Gamba, and especially Joe. These references aren't just neat little easter eggs. They're actually crucial story points in Gurren Lagann and in Joe, so they're joined at the hip a lot more than people give credit for. But before I begin, I want to warn everyone that unlike my Megalobox video, this is the first video I make where I am spoiling my favorite show to you in a video. Yeah, these spoilers are 50 years old by now, but it's by no means ingrained in the public consciousness like Star Wars or something. If you want to skip to the end, where I still have a solid conclusion for you, here's the time code to skip to. But you can watch a part of the way through before I really spoil things for you, if you want. I'll give you another warning when that happens. There are seven major references to Ashtono Joe in Gurren Lagann. Again, I could go in with a fine-tooth comb and make a bunch of guesses. For example, Simon encounters Viral in prison, just like how Joe meets his rival Rikishi in prison. I even have a quote from Imaishi to back it up. He talks about how he and Nakashima wanted a whole episode that takes place in prison, and they would include references to Joe being tortured with a twisted stick and parachute, but he said it was impossible considering what came after it. So it's more of a coincidence than a potential reference, even though it's one of a handful of times that the creators actually mention Joe. But let's start with one of those few confirmed Joe references. One that's so obvious, even the person interviewing them recognizes it. <laughs> So that's why there are pigs in episode 1. Exactly, quite perceptive of you. Nice one, W. That's what I wanted you to notice. Lamau! The scene shows Kamina attempting to use a stampede of pig moles to escape to the surface, just like how Joe attempts to use a stampede of pigs to escape prison. Both are swiftly stopped and are punished for their actions. Now, why reference this scene? It's a very crude yet distinct representation of Joe and Kamina's reckless masculinity. And I'm using masculinity instead of the word motivation because it isn't simply about what these characters want. It's about getting what they want exactly how they want to get it. To stick to their guiding principles, everything else be damned. Except it's clearly the wrong way to go about it. Kamina's plan here is foolish, fueled by nothing but his boastful attitude. In Joe, this wasn't even a plan! It was born out of happenstance, and he was just taking advantage of the chaos. Both Joe and Kamina look like they're in control, like they're gallantly riding some noble steed, but they're not. They're using these untamed beasts to achieve this goal of escaping and thinking that's going to work. Neither of them make it to their respective barriers, but even if they got to them, would it even have really worked? This is meant to contrast with the vehicles with which they later channel their masculinity into. In Kamina's case, it's Simone and Lagan, and in Joe's case, it's boxing and his vendetta against Rikishi. You can even see this demonstrated on each gate later, Simone using Lagan to break free from the underground, and Rikishi leaving prison to pursue boxing. For the next one, I must admit something. I said Joe was the reason I wanted to make this video. This exact scene is why. Yes, this is not originally from Gurren Lagann. This is a reference to Rikishi pointing to the heavens, saying he'll knock Joe out in under a minute. 
Now, pointing upwards is a pretty generic action that can probably be found in other series. For example, it's pretty iconic in the final episode of Mobile Suit Gundam, and it may well be calling to that scene given Logon's Tomino influences. But considering the other more overt Joe references in the series, and also Imaishi and Nakashima are huge Joe nerds, I'm pretty confident in my presumption, but again, let's ask ourselves why. Kamina's pointing is initially very literal. He always believed there was a surface, and he's just dramatically pointing to it. But even after they've left the underground, Kamina keeps pointing to the sky. He predicts they can go even further and pierce the heavens. It's incorporated into Gurren Lagann's finishing move, the Giga Drill Break, so it's also a sign of dominance. The pointing in Joe is literally both of these things. The scene that precedes this first moment is an argument that's being dominated by Joe, but when asked if he would agree to a boxing match, Rikishi calmly yet powerfully predicts not just to win, but to humiliate Joe. It's such a badass moment that he completely turns the tables and ends the argument there, winning everyone's approval. He ends up losing the bet later, but it's still enough to leave an impression on Joe. And that's the important thing. It's less of a promise to oneself, and more of a promise to everyone witnessing. Which is why Kamina does it at least twice for Simon's eyes only. The spooky thing about the pointing in Joe is how it comes back later, when Carlos predicts his victory in a similar fashion, to win a match in one round. Carlos had never met Rikishi, but he actually achieves his prediction not in one round, but in under a minute, which fulfills Rikishi's promise. The pointing is something that reoccurs in Gurren Lagann too, not just by Simone, but also Nia and Katan. Carlos didn't do that for his opponent. He did that for Joe, who was watching him in the crowd. And even later on, Joe does it himself, not for his opponent, but for Jose, predicting he'll win in two rounds. Predicting how you will win in a sport is seen as very cocky, a power move, if you will. It's a masculine thing to do, which actually fits with how potentially toxic it can be if you can't deliver on that prediction. But it's not so much about the prediction as it is a symbol. Joe and Gurren Lagann use it as an icon of strength and confidence. I will say Gurren Lagann definitely has more ownership of this symbol than Joe does. It's literally carved into stone as Kamina's statue, and in the movie, Simone uses it right as he summons a drill of his own blood to deliver the final blow against the anti-spiral. I think the three predictions in Joe are all great moments on their own, but they aren't widely remembered as... This is one of two scenes everyone brings up when they talk about the Joe references, which makes sense since it's colored and framed the exact same way, and a character literally says cross counter. This is arguably Joe's signature move. It's what decides most of Joe's early fights, and often signifies a sort of kinship with his opponent, albeit a hostile one. It visually symbolizes an even matchup, transforming the fight from being about two enemies to two rivals. In this instance, it's the first punch in Kamina's reversal of what was otherwise a losing fight, where he was getting beat down over and over but kept standing up. Exactly like Joe's fight with Rikishi, where this precise cross counter landed. This was the fight where Viral became not simply Kamina's enemy, but Kamina's rival, developing this obsessive kinship with Kamina to the point where he didn't even realize the moment he defeats Kamina till later. Viral then comes to respect Simone as a new rival, and eventually a partner after a fight that almost lands in another cross counter. The best part of this, however, is that it ties neatly into our core theme of masculinity. The attack isn't just a coincidence of two fighters punching each other at the same time. The way the cross counter is effective is by letting your opponent throw the punch first, and then you let your arm slide over theirs to land with double or triple the force of their punch, at least by Dompe's logic. You can see in Gurren Lagann's cross counter, Kamina's arm slides over Viral's, and the spectators cheering for it as a cross counter shows it was a coordinated attack. However, if you must have noticed, this does entail letting yourself be hit, which if done over and over again, 
will add up to a lot of sustained damage. That's a lot of damage. That's a lot of damage. That's a lot of damage. It's not that much damage, really, Phil. It's not, could, could be a lot worse. As what happens in Joe. This isn't so much a factor in Gurren Lagann, but to show the characters using it, even in the final battle against the Anti-Spiral, reflects the potential toxicity of their strategy. It's a self-inflicting attack, one that says you're willing to accept repercussions, or in this case, concussions, if it might guarantee victory. However, while the cross counter is probably the most iconic punch, it's not the only iconic punch. Yuck! <laughs> this is the other scene besides the pointing that I see as a Joe reference, but I haven't seen anyone else mention. It's much like the devastating punch Joe receives from Rikishi and others. Yeah, it's just a punch to the face, pretty generic action, but I'd justify the connection the same way as the pointing. There's so many other more overt references to Joe, I'm willing to bet the connection. <laughs> the grit those teeth quote is most certainly a Gurren Lagann original, a very good one at that, but the purpose of both punches are pretty identical. It's a wake-up punch. It's aggressive, but it's not malicious. It's used when the character is stuck in a frame of mind and another character comes in to snap them out of it. Kamina does this twice to Simone to shake him awake and focus on their mission. And again, like the pointing, Simone harkens back to it, giving a good one to Rossiu. Only they totally changed in the movie. What a shame. This punch happens to Joe three, maybe four times. The first one really being the central reference point, even framed like Gurren Lagann's first punch. Is the right straight, Rikishi totally clobbers on Joe, knocking him out. Rikishi's is what gets called back to when Joe spars with Carlos and gets hit with a similar punch. And while not explicitly called back to the same way, Joe gets instantly KO'd by Jose by a familiar punch. This scene afterwards, I think, alludes to the similarity. <laughs> Call me crazy, but I think solving your problems with punches is a pretty masculine idea. If you want to achieve something and the first thing you think of is using your fists, how is that not inherently manly? I can understand if that comes off as crude or cowardly or violent to some, but what I'm consistently impressed by from Joe and from Gurren Lagann is when you think closely about how this behavior is framed, you can tell there's a difference between what's toxic and what's genuinely well-meaning. Joe is a serious asshole a lot of times, and I've seen viewers get upset thinking the series condones or glorifies his behavior. Yes, Joe can be toxic and also succeed. Sometimes assholes get what they want, but comparing those victories to the victories he earns fairly, always through a vehicle that can channel his masculinity in a productive way like boxing, it's clear what the series is trying to frame as the right path. It's true that Kamina isn't a complete failure. He's not useless without Simone. But compare his victories to the victories Simone manages to achieve. Gurren Lagann makes it pretty clear which is better. At least one of them doesn't end in death. <laughs> Every anime fan has seen some variation of the final shot in Ashita no Jo, with a character sitting ghost white, smiling while unconscious. I don't consider it a spoiler because it's actually supposed to be ambiguous to whether Joe really dies in that last shot, but that doesn't matter much since Gurren Lagann is clearly using it to illustrate Kamina's death. <laughs> Imaishi commented on why he chose Joe for this scene. Like I mentioned earlier, he stated Kamino represented the 70s era, so he wanted an icon that represented the end of the 70s to stand in for Kamina's death, aka the death of the 70s. So he chose Ashita no Joe 2, which Imaishi and Nakashima are big fans of, which came out in the fall of 1980 with this shot airing late 1981. What I do consider a spoiler, the greatest spoiler, the spoiler I've never explicitly said on my channel before is the death in Ashita no Jo this is a reference to. Now, 
I'm not just saying it's a reference to Rikishi's death merely because they're both deaths. There is so much more to this. First is how Kamina is initially struck. Notice the Tazaki tribute by having it play four times with a postcard memory each time, but also notice how it strikes Kamina's temple, which is where Joe lands a punch on Rikishi. But both Kamina and Rikishi aren't just killed by one blow. It's a culmination of their actions, their opponent's actions, and bad luck. For Rikishi, it's the temple punch from Joe, but also his severe weight loss and accidentally hitting the back of his head against the ropes that causes a brain aneurysm. For Kamina, he had his guard down. He just so happened to be standing right where the beastmen blasted out of, and it was two against one. They got him. In this way, there's no one party that can be solely blamed for their death. Interestingly though, the reasons Rikishi and Kamina are partly responsible for their demise both have to do with their closest companions. Kamina had his guard down because he was encouraging Simone. Rikishi lost all that weight so he could be in the same weight class to fight Joe. Both Simone and Joe would naturally try and blame themselves for their friend's death. But no matter how well-intentioned, it was squarely Kamina's and Rikishi's decision, and they each paid the price for it. Death is always on the table when it comes to boxing, or piloting giant robots. It's easy to assume these characters are invincible, until proven otherwise in an instant. <laughs> Of course, if it was over just like that, it'd be a real bummer! <laughs> the other major reason these two deaths are the same is these factors don't actually kill them right away. They both miraculously get up and continue to fight and win their battles in the most glorious, spectacular way possible. <laughs> them. They're amazing. There's nobody like them. What a fucking man. And after they've finished what they started on their terms, only then do they slip away, right in front of their closest companion's eyes. Fuck, dude. They're gone. Nobody who acts like this 
talks like this and strives for greatness like this wants to die. Being a man may include staring death in the face, but it's never literally in the plan. It's also really important that this happens to such pivotal characters, whose deaths send shockwaves that never quite disappear. Their deaths are their own, but they also hurt other people. Another notable similarity is how it affects Yoko and... Yoko. Oh, for fu- Both of them are crushed by the deaths of men they never got to tell how much they loved them and are left holding the bag, looking for somebody else to fill it. It's a warning of what this road inevitably leads to, but it's also repurposed into a very powerful motivation. Simone and Joe are reborn from this trauma into better people and in their own ways follow in their fallen friend's footsteps to achieve even greater things, even the impossible. Hope is born out of tragedy, even if it takes great suffering to get there. He looks determined without being ruthless. Something heroic in his men. There's a courage about him. Doesn't look like a killer. Comes across so calm. Acts like he has a dream. Full of passion. I was actually caught off guard from this reference, only picking it up on my rewatch of the show. Simone and Joe react vaguely similar to the deaths of their friends. After some listfulness and angst, they try and roar back stronger than ever, only to instinctively vomit their guts out. And I know it's from Joe, because they even make it sparkly like how Dazaki did it. In Joe's case, they refer to it as Rikishi's ghost haunting Joe preventing him from throwing a punch like the one he used to kill Rikishi. In Gurren Lagann, Simon is so overcome with rage, the spiral energy overloads, causing the robot to spit the excess out. Though I like that Simon actually seems to hurl as well. Both of them don't want to, and resist what's happening to them, but it's out of their control, and takes them out of commission. It's a hopeless situation for both of them. Their vehicles are broken from witnessing their friends overdosing on masculinity. I think this happens as a way to have their bodies physically deal with grief. Since grieving runs antithetical to the confident, smiling man's man that Simone and Joe try to live by, they need a physical block to slam on the brakes so they can properly sort things out. It also happens to take an outsider force a new character, that being Nia and Carlos, to break them out of this cycle and cure what's plaguing them. I like this because it shows the importance of having good people around you. They can refocus your center of gravity and discover new vehicles to channel themselves into. Both Simone and Joe would go on to challenge past the boundaries of their worlds, Simone literally leaving Earth to defeat the Anti-Spiral, and Joe moving beyond Japan and taking on the world champion. They overcome challenge after challenge, with no fear, no shame, and no fucks given, until they can't reach any higher. They've pierced the heavens and made it to the final boss. And it's during that fight, right in the middle of them, do we see our last major connection. The very last Joe reference I have takes from the scene I've been making all these analogies with, Ishikawa, Super Robots, Gainax, and Kanada passing the torch to Nakashima, Real Robots, Trigger, and Imaishi. And don't worry, I'm not gonna do that again, like, you know, Joe passing something on to Gurren Lagann. I like to think of these two more like companion pieces. 
This vision of Simone meeting and talking with Kamina again in the penultimate episode reminds me of an anime original scene in the penultimate episode of Joe encountering and fighting Rikishi again. I understand this is actually a very common trope in a lot of anime, but again, I think it holds enough thematic similarities to justify the comparison. Both dreams are initially contextualized with significant memories of their past, Joe and Rikishi's time in prison, and a previously off-screen heist by Simone and Kamina. However, both scenes are warped in some way. There's a lot of continuity and dreamlike elements in Joe's dream, like being on a beach, and it's never explained if Simone's heist with Kamina was even real to begin with, though it would explain the origin of the glasses. What can be said for sure is that both dreams portray each old friend in their best light, with Rikichi portrayed as the world champion and Kamina as the confident caped captain. This means each dream by the respective dreamer is, like most dreams, self-serving, even having realistic banter and laughter, something I'm sure Simone and Joe desperately miss. It's meant as an encouragement or blessing before they head out to defeat their opponents. I see both scenes as crucial and series-defining, albeit in ways specific for their respective series. <laughs> they, they are still completely different shows after all! For Joe, this scene reveals his whole hand. Jose was just the next Carlos, who himself was just the next Rikishi. He literally says this to Yoko, asking her to find the next Rikishi. He's always wanted to fight Rikishi as the world champion. A few minutes after the dream, he still sees Rikishi's face instead of Jose's. And then it cuts away to this breathtaking fight he's still dreaming of while in the middle of fighting Jose. I'm going out of my way to describe it because Gurren Lagann actually makes an interesting departure from this. In Simon's dream, he starts out in the role he played in the beginning as Kamina's tool, but he quickly sees what that gets him, forced to bow his head into the ground because he's a lackey to an even bigger tool. This vision isn't quite a depiction of what Kamina was like. He certainly wouldn't be so quick to bow his head, but as we saw in the very beginning with the boars, if it was done his way, this is likely where they'd end up. That's when Simon sees the Kamina who believes in him, his idealized version of Kamina, who encourages Simon to ditch that loser in favor of believing in his own drill. And here is where it departs from Joe. Instead of seeing Kamina and pursuing him, Simon leaves off to fulfill his mission. He doesn't say goodbye, because of course that wouldn't be the manliest thing to do. You gotta tell that man's man they'll always be with you in your heart. Cute. Or continue to chase after him, like Joe, or like he did when he was a kid. He's got the torch now. He's the taller one. Instead, Simone embodies Kamina. He grows up and achieves the impossible. Perhaps that's one reason why Joe doesn't end up winning against Jose, because all he ever was interested in was the chase. He wanted a fight. He didn't care if he won or lost. The result only mattered if it meant getting to fight the next guy. But when you just fought the champion of the world, and there is no next guy, y you can see why Joe has a smile on his face regardless of the outcome. <laughs> That's the true spirit of masculinity. It's catharsis, the feeling of relief and happiness from the completion of a job well done. It's the emotion humanity always looks for in everything that they do. The reason they keep living. Everyone assumes Joe dies at the end of the series, but Osamu Tezaki said it's not about whether he died, it's about how he lived. Joe got exactly what he wanted. He had the greatest day of his life. Simone finished what he started, and while he couldn't live happily ever after, he was satisfied and at peace. Ultimately, Simone and Joe had different goals, and both achieved them, no matter how bittersweet it may seem to everyone else. They both leave their friends and their vehicles behind. Because once you've pierced the heavens, heaven is all that's left. Joe is less of an inspiration to Gurren Lagann, and more of a kindred spirit. Equals on different paths. Just because something like masculinity can be toxic, that shouldn't mean nothing good can come of it. 
All it takes is the right inspiration to get you there. Inspiration is a very human quality. We all have it without often realizing it. Our values, perspectives, and dreams are shaped by the people and the art around us. Even if that art inspires you the way it never intended, I'm inspired by my friends every day, and I couldn't be more grateful for them. The jealousy I feel when I see videos better than mine drives me crazy. That is the toxic thing that I deal with. And this channel is the vehicle I drive that energy into. Thank God I don't make anime because I would have given up. I respect Gurren Lagann a lot, and enjoyed it even more the second time around when I understood where it all came from. I never realized the irony that Gurren Lagann has all these inspirations, when the show itself is so crucially about inspiration. Learning from your heroes and doing it even better. My only disappointment with the show is that Gurren Lagann doesn't seem to have led its fans back to these other works, which are just as much worth experiencing. That's obviously not something Gurren Lagann is responsible for, and fans certainly aren't obligated to watch them. When you point all this out to people, you're trying to say, therefore watch this other thing, but that doesn't always end up happening. These anime are by no means obscure, everyone's heard of Evangelion or Gundam, but compared to the likelihood that they've seen Gurren Lagann, these fans probably haven't seen most of these inspirations. But I truly believe that, because I've watched and studied anime's history, I'll never fall out of love with anime. And I'm so happy to say that. You get this sentiment in the community that fans of Gurren Lagann aren't often fans of giant robots, or just older anime in general. And I think as a result, those of us who are into all those things might treat Gurren Lagann as just an entry-level anime, but we shouldn't. It's not an entry-level anime, it's a gateway anime. It's such a wonderful celebration of what makes anime so great. I understand I'm addressing more of a long-standing problem in the community, not enough of these anime fans are watching the classics, and it's something my channel has been advocating for this whole time, and I never actually noticed that until people would describe it that way. I hadn't realized how much these older anime had inspired me to talk about them. But as elaborate and long as I can make these videos, they can only do so much. I'm probably only talking to just a handful of people who've made it this far in. Hopefully I've motivated some of you to finally getting around to some of these wonderful stories. Not just because they inspired Gurren Lagann, but because anime is so much bigger than I think most fans bother to tap into. Something I'm looking forward to is for an anime in the future to be inspired by Gurren Lagann and continue the chain. Something that applies what Gurren Lagann did, and achieves that same degree of success. Since most of Gurren Lagann's inspirations are over 20 years older, we still have a little while before the time is right. But while we haven't seen that inspiration in other anime yet, there's no doubt it's impacted everyone else. It's inspired tons of people that have molded their personal outlooks on the values Gurren Lagann championed. Heck, it obviously inspired me to make this whole video as grand as it is influence can be invisible, even in Gurren Lagann. I just talked about the obvious shit. I see those Yamato references. There definitely could have been a part six on Leiji Matsumoto, but it goes even deeper. Imaishi mentions how episode four was the most Hajime Ningen Gyatrodus episode, and how the ball-shaped beastmen combining together like that is a 21 Amon reference? Nobody in the West, or even Japan probably, would have caught on to that. But ideas can come from anywhere. We may never fully see what impact this series had on anime, but we can affect the impact Gurren Lagann has on anime fans. Check this stuff out for yourself. Learn about who actually made what you love. Learn about the artists your favorite artists love. And then check those artists' favorites, and so on. Spread the word about that art. Advocate for it. Get inspired. Maybe make something yourself. You'll never know what it could do to inspire others. Maybe it'll reach that Kamina you always looked up to, and they in turn might look up to you. 
Think about all the art we're leaving behind on the internet. We'll probably never know how long it'll last, and how many lives it will touch. It's powerful, and it'd be a waste to not grab onto that and run with it. Art inspires more art, which inspires more art, and so on. It builds and builds and gets better and better whether we actually come to appreciate it or not. I look forward to more art inspiring me. I hope my art can inspire you. I guess humanity really does run on spiral energy. We make and we grow like a spiral expanding forever. Such a